I think I think we are on time and we can get started. Uh, but before, I would like to uh, make a few uh, words in Japanese. Mina san konnichiwa, yoroshiku ana desu. Kite kurete arigatou gozaimasu. Kyo wa ospo ospo saisin no niusu nitsuite appyo si yo to omotte Ja Ego <laughs> um, so yeah, now let's switch to English. Um, I was saying that, well, my name is Ana Jimenez, and today I'm here to talk about the recent news on the state of OSPOS this year. So saying that, let's get started. Um, about a little bit of myself, I'm currently uh, working at the Linux Foundation in one of the projects that is called Judo Group. Judo Group is a group of practitioners advocating for open source program offerings uh, inside organizations. Uh, this community develops best practices, toolings uh, to help others uh, to run and develop effective OSPOS and open source entities in organizations. Previous to that, um, I had some open source background uh, working at Viteria, that is a software development analytics firm. Uh, in there, I got the honor to work with uh, many organizations in their OSPOS metrics journeys and inner source metrics journeys there. I had a master's degree in data science. Uh, my previous work was focused on measuring uh, the success of developer relations in open source communities. And in my spare time and also in my working time, I'm involved in uh, other open source communities such as Open Chain, Chaos Project of Community Health Metrics, or in our source commons. Um, so I'm aware that many people here uh, knows the term of the OSPO or is a, maybe they already have an OSPO or are uh, at the very beginning of building one. But I just wanted to make sure that we are on the same page. Uh, so in simple terms, the OSPO is this linchpin in between the organization's open source activities and the community and open source projects. Uh, they provide the people behind the OSPO are open source experts providing support, advice, knowledge, strategy about open source. And they try to map it with the organizational culture and all the policies and processes that are in place. Um, so um, they need to engage with different teams and, uh, and different stakeholders. And I think also an easy minute image to think about the OSPO is this one. So they put all the all chaos into order and uh, they match and, and link the dots between the organization and all the, all, all the open source ecosystem stakeholders. And for those Japanese speakers, uh, the people at Cybertrust have been creating great content in Japanese on what is an open source program office. They even have a manga chapter uh, introducing uh, the role of the OSPO, the OSPO value. And I think it's, it's a really great content if, if you speak Japanese and English because the manga is also has been translated into English uh, this week, is, I think. All right. Uh, so. Before this introduction, I would like to continue sharing some of the recent studies and, and recent insights we found uh, from our latest um, OSPO uh, report. So um, this is a survey that we conduct uh, to do every single year. We started in 2018 and the, and the goal when, when creating this was to get a pulse on how OSPOs are evolving across regions and worldwide, and what is the status of OSPOs. Um, this year, in 2023, um, we, found, we, we got a lot of, uh, a big number of um, Asia Pacific organizations, that is like headquarter, um, organizations headquartered in Asia Pacific uh, regions, um, compared to other years, which I think it was great that people participating so actively in here. And also regarding demographics, of course, we still, the majority is still uh, 
of respondents came from the IT, but it's interesting to find out that 28% of, of, of these respondents came from end user organizations uh, that consume IT products or, or services, or even some of them showing up from the government agency or the academic field. Um, and what does these insights and, and this survey told us? Well, uh, generally speaker, uh, speaking, uh, we are seeing uh, he asserts in adoption. Uh, we compare with the last year, and actually we saw a 32 increase. Uh, I think these are good news, but I still we still need more, more, more things to do and more work to do to uh, help more organizations to be uh, successfully be adopt adopting these entities, these open source entities. Um, we saw this adoption not only in the software sector. We are seeing, as I mentioned, uh, other organizations outside the software industry adopting OSPOS. Uh, I wanted to share some of the examples. Uh, mostly of those are from Europe because, well, I'm 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 European and it's like my day-to-day -day life and I. I'm more aware of what's happening here. So Aliander, uh, that comes from the Netherlands, comes from the energy sector. They have been having the OSPO in the last three years and also implemented, uh, started with is in our source and OSPOs are the same. Deutsche Bahn comes from transportation, also with an OSPO. Uh, Mercedes, sports, or IKEA, those are other kinds of sectors where they are implementing OSPOs because they are seeing the value of even though software is not the primary revenue, uh, they know that software is in the heart of everything on their day-to-day -day activities and they need to uh, build a strategic posture around open source. And what happens outside the corporate world? Well, also in Europe, we are seeing a massive, a massive growth uh, from OSPOs in the public sector. If you want to learn more about how, for instance, the Czech Republic has an OSPO, the European Commission grows an OSPO, Germany as well are doing, uh, there is a research specific of the European public sector and the open source opportunity where you can deep dive more into that. And well, the list goes on and on. This is part of one of our to do initiatives called the OSPO landscape uh, that was a fork from the CNCF landscape that I guess most of people knows, where we try to map all the different organizations. There are not, not all of those of, of, of all are here because well, it, the, the organization or representative from our organization needs to submit a pull request to actually be, at, be there. Uh, but we try to, uh, try to maintain this and try to share like all the different organizations that are adopting OSPOS. Um, so this was a general overview. Let's now deep dive more into what's going on in Asia or in Asia Pacific. Um, in general, we saw, yeah, like organizations that are increasing the adoption of OSPOS. But if you take a look on the growth on uh, one uh, compared to last year of Asia Pacific, it's the, the, the blue uh, line, okay? You will see, so this was a question asking that uh, that your organization have an open source program or, or similar open source initiative. Uh, the first line is yes, and it's formally structured, and the second is yes, and it's informally structured because, well, no OS OSPOs are quite different, and that doesn't mean that it's good or bad. Uh, but we can see that in 2022, the ones that reported, yes, it's 26%, 22%. And then this year, the ones that reported is formally structured grow and to a uh, 54%. I mean, that, that is quite impressive. Uh, we analyzed exactly like the growth. The growth was like a 108% in just one year. No. Okay. So there was one. I don't remember which slide was this one, but I, we cannot say it. Um, anyways, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, the, the next topic uh, is about um, yeah. See, so we want to. Uh, we also analyze the value of the OSPO. 
uh, what brings to, to the organization and, and maybe emerging trends that, that uh, OSPO can play uh, in, in this year and the years ahead. We, we found interesting, um, uh, an interesting opportunity and we are also seeing OSPOs actually doing this of, um, okay, images are not so enough. That's why, I for some reason, not sorry about that, but that, that was an image, but okay, anyways. Um, so we are seeing to be connected and being the support team of the security teams in the organizations. So the security teams uh, wants to, might, want to improve security and software quality and uh, the OSPO can help to uh, act as an advisor and uh, oh okay interesting sorry about that and for instance uh, these are like some examples um, uh, trying to look out for the vulnerabilities associated with open source software and products and so that in the organization there are uh, security best practices in place uh, and also ensure that there are best practices for developers to uh, develop and contribute to a more secure software. Um, actually, we, anal we try also to deep dive more into this in our past uh, survey, and we found out that 93% of the OSPOs or, an op or similar open source initiative provided advice or decisions on open source software security issues. And we, as a community, we have been trying to try to explore more this close collaboration uh, between um, security and OSPOS, now trying to collaborate with OpenSSF in somehow uh, to see how can we better leverage OSPOS as the security team and support team of the of security teams and, and help with, with this goals. Also, we found out that more than half of these organizations with the OSPO had automated processes uh, to address an open source license compliance, and somehow they were more prepared uh, to uh, manage risk in the organizations. Oh, and this is um, one of the um, common um, initiatives or common um, articles we did with OpenSSF uh, to explore like how OSPOS can be this key lever for open source sustainability and security. We share like some baseline best practices and I hope that maybe in the next year we can um, deep dive more into that and, and explore more this collaboration. And uh, now that AI is like a trending topic, I also wanted to highlight this was not added into the survey report, but in the community we had monthly meetings where uh, we have like panel discussions on topics that matters to OSPOS. And on September we, we had like a, a presentation, well, a panel discussion on internal AI compliance programs and the role of OSPOS. And we were exploring like how some OSPOS were having these conversations with the um, with the um, compliance team on building an AI compliance program inside the organization to how to use in uh, when developing code uh, AI tools in general. And also part of this conversation turned into a mini summit at the KubeCon event in Aspology Live to try to find the intersection between OSPOS legal team and cloud native technologies. But this is still under uh, discussion though. Hmm. Uh, then another OSPO opportunity uh, we were trying to explore in this, um, in this survey uh, was how the OSPO can be the support team of engineering teams. Uh, because, uh, well, when engineering teams are looking for efficiency and developer happening, happiness, the OSPO can play a crucial role. Some examples, uh, the OSPO can plan and set up a strategy of open source and sponsorship and project funding of the critical projects that are relevant to the organizations, like through, fun like through um, donating to foundations or to, oh sorry, it's not food funds, it's um, FOSS funds, like free open source software funds. And so that open source contribution uh, philosophy and processes and tools are in place in the organization. Uh, set up best practices for developers to 
allow them to contribute to upstream projects um, or even develop our ambassadors programs to engage and keep the community and the employees engaged with these open source projects. These are some examples of what I was mentioning earlier of one, one practices that OSPOs are doing on uh, creating false funds in the organizations. Uh, I believe the first one was done by Dwayne O'Brien, previously OSPO at Indeed. And they even, he even um, published a, a book where they share uh, their strategy of building the false fund. And this was then later adopted by Microsoft uh, with their uh, open source software fund, Bloomberg, um, and even Spotify uh, have been adopting this false funds um, strat uh, plan in, in their, in their OSPO strategy. Um, and also another nice practice I'm seeing around Europe is the false manifestos. I think this brings this um, high level view and high level commitment of the organization and serves the value of open source and the commitment of open source for the organization. So this is public, uh, this is for employees and for outside uh, people outside their organizations where they serve their company principles, the employee principles, um, for instance, in Mercedes or in ports of why are they using open source, why they contribute to open source and how do they do, how they do that. And you can go to the different websites because all this information, they are sharing it public. Um, and so regarding this, uh, we found in this, uh, in this survey that um, organizations with an OSPO were uh, helping these upstream contributions indeed. They, they were having this upstream contribution proficiency. For instance, 96% of these organizations had an OSPO and those helped to driven significant improvements in software development best practices. And organizations with an OSPO uh, were four more times likely to provide upstream contributions in the organization. And also interesting to find out that we ask and organizations with OSPO uh, were at somehow um, engaging with uh, top uh, leading edge technology. Uh, the top ones were cloud containers and visualization and AI ML, ML analytics. Um, all these are great news and I'm, I'm really glad that, well, we are seeing this huge involution in, in just one year. Uh, but of course, we also found challenges and we found um, critical and important di data that we should be aware of and maybe try to work together in the upcoming years on how to overcome these challenges. Uh, the, sad, the bad news was that well, we found out that the funding expectations uh, to uh, worldwide, I'm um, uh, thinking, uh, were decreased. So the ones that says uh, funding for OSPOs is likely to decrease. Last year, they said 12% uh, respondents answered that. And this year, it increased to 23%. Um, and, and this uh, might be because uh, the value of the OSPO is, might be not fully understood, not within the OSPO, but outside. So all the decision makers and all the people in the organization outside the OSPO might not understand this and that might cause this reduction in funding because also um, there is there is also a, something that I keep hearing from OSPOs is that um, we cannot start seeing like economic benefits or and people are like expecting to have economic benefits from that or we cannot start building a community and, and having community engagement in, in one year or in two uh, because it takes time and uh, even when if the organization has a really traditional culture or mindset, that's going to be even harder. You first need to work on making this open source culture in the organization. 
and that takes a while. So um, what can we do? Um, there are different things and I, I don't have an answer to that, honestly. Um, but I, I feel like uh, being able to communicate this clear message of what does open source means uh, within organization and how can this be transmitted? Not focus only on one uh, picture of the, of the whole framework, like not just focus on compliance because that is what oh, the, my, my boss or my manager uh, understood that. Uh, to uh, start thinking of open source from compliance perspective, governance perspective, community and strategy. Um, and build education, uh, advocacy, guidance, and uh, sustain and, and how to sustain open source projects that matter to you. Uh, in general terms, it's about having the whole and a holistic approach uh, to open source through the OSPO. That is this vehicle to build a strategic posture and put a strategy on top of all the open source operations. And secondly, um, collaborate with open source organizations. This collaboration uh, should be with other OSPOs because sometimes you're doing things that your peers are also doing and you don't even know because you are not communicating. Also with open source foundations, um, people working in foundations uh, have deep experience on open source and they can help as well and assist you if you have any issues. And also, of course, open source projects and communities. And by projects and communities, I mean global, but also local. And about collaboration, this is something that we try to promote in, in the Tutor Group. Uh, we are, uh, it's open source, of course, and we, all the best practices that we develop as, as a community, it's, uh, 100% uh, open source or the, all the initiatives and all the tooling is 100% open source because the organizations and the representatives of these organizations that are supporting to do are committed to spread and to share what they learn uh, to everyone. So that is our, our mission. I will say we are uh, on one side is a uh, OSP education hub. You can find guides, you can find uh, mind maps, you can find glossaries, you can find landscape to help people to get started and continue their OSPO journey. Uh, and you, we are also um, a group of OSPO practitioners and advocates uh, that can also help and, and have these uh, conversations with you. And we are also a backup channel where OSPO professionals can rely uh, to set up uh, and managing OSPOs. Um, and of course, we try to promote this holistic view of open source. Uh, we try to promote that community is important, governance is important, strategy is important, and compliance, and not just focusing on one. Of course, you can start a small and focus first on one section, but keeping in mind that uh, at some point, you should be bringing this whole framework to the organization. And we are not in this together. Um, we have some programs uh, because we believe that it's important. OSPOs are everywhere. And we know that even if you're engaging with other Linux Foundation and non-Linux Foundation projects or foundations, you might have heard or you might know OSPOs being there. And we believe that it's important to collaborate with uh, projects that are helping the OSPO movement somehow. So that's why we have this um, OSPO Associate Program. And for those people that maybe they are not in our organizations, but they are contributing to Tudu uh, and they really want to help Tudu mission, we have the Tudu Ambassadors Program for individuals committed uh, to our mission and to uh, help OSPO adoption worldwide. And one example of this collaboration, uh, now that we are in Open Source Summit Japan, is the uh, Open Chain, uh, Open Chain uh, Japan and Tudor Group um, local OSPO local meetup. Uh, they, I think they um, some some of our uh, of the community members are around here, uh, but they I think they meet uh, bi-weekly, and they are trying to develop um, 
an open source program office easy frequently asked questions in Japanese. All this is in Japanese because we think it's important to promote also the local um, activities happen, happening around OSPOS in their local language. And uh, they also are translating this in English. So they, they have both resources available for both kinds of people. And if you are not part of the tutor group or you would like to get engaged now more, uh, we have an, a new and nice get started page of four simple steps where you can deep dive more uh, and get involved into the community. And that's all. If there are any questions now, I will be happy to answer them. So I'm a professor at a university and the tech transfer office in my university is very focused on commercialization. Um, to the uh, intended exclusion of open source. And I'm wondering if you can try to talk with them and talk some sense into them. And have you had experience with that in the past, uh, working with universities? I, I'm only aware of a few universities that have an office like this. Um, yeah, so they, uh, I think the, you are, I don't know if you're aware of the sustain, um, Foundation, foundation, yeah. So they they recently launched a academic working group uh, that all the academic OSPOs are gathering, and they are having I think it's biweekly meetings and so on, and they are really focused only on academic because I know like there are similarities, but sometimes there are specific questions and issues that only academic OSPOs are facing. So I think they are doing a great job in. Uh, promoting that and helping and having this kind of uh, community around. So um, if you go to the to the to the Slack channel, I I try to share uh, when when those are and, and maybe they will be happy to to help and assist. Is that on the open SSF Slack or which Slack are you open, on? Oh, no, no. The So we have a to do group Slack and they are having these working groups. I think they are sharing through Discord, the sustained Discord, but I I try to share it also on to do like every every time they have some kind of um, meeting because those are virtual meetings. So and try, I, I try my best to, to try to share it. Hi, um, I work at um, ThoughtWorks and we often have engineers who are rotating between clients and have free time available. Um, what's your like tips or recommendations for getting the conversation started about starting an OSPO at a, an organization that's enterprise focused? Okay, so um, I get this question a lot and before sharing my thoughts, I always need to say, uh, your OSPO is not my OSPO. Um, our OSPOs are good, uh, but um, sometimes this kind of question is gonna be uh, attached to your organizational culture. Like for instance, so we go top down or down to bot uh, bottom, down, bottom up. Um, and I've seen OSPOs been doing both of them and seeing those process starting from, from the high level managers. That is gonna depend on the nature of your organization. Um, and that's why, that's why we are having, for instance, this kind of um, spaces where you can ask this question and not just me saying, oh, so there are many OSPOs, but OSPO practitioners, many OSPO practitioners sharing their, their views. Um, Hi, 
Yeah, ju just a reflection for the last uh, uh, talk about the how formed the Osborn. I just share some kind of experience since we are from Volvocar, just formed the Osborn in the beginning of this year. And uh, for Anna's information, you can put Volvos in your slides as well next time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm from WordPress, and I am trying to convince, uh, uh, and then my company has an OSPO of about 5% of the employees, but I'm trying to involve other companies that are also using WordPress to uh, get involved. And uh, you, you mentioned the uh, difficulty of uh, sharing the message and you know uh, seeing the, I guess, ROI. Um, is there one key message um, for example, case studies or marketing value or anything that is tend to be you know, helpful. So there are different angles you can take. Um, so most people, for instance, are using the risk uh, mitigation or risk management methods. Uh, they start uh, by uh, scanning all, for instance, in, in their products, how percentage is being as open source being used. And usually that is scares uh, the many people from the organizations. And that is like the first step. And then telling them or trying to share, uh, to share with them the importance of, okay, you're using this, but you're not doing anything about that. Uh, but for instance, you have a security team and you will never imagine you need, you, you will, uh, when, when things are bad or when the economic is bad, you will never imagine to get rid of the security team. Why you are not having, why you're not putting investment in open source experts that can help to reduce risk of um, critical infrastructure of your products that you're selling to your clients. That is one message, but of course it's not the message. There are so many different angles. And again, this is gonna depend on the organizational uh, business and the organizational culture. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, as in, in your slide, uh, recently some OSPO is decreased by the because of the by, by the company. And uh, do you have any suggestion how to show <coughs> the OSPO value to the management people, uh, especially focusing some, for example, for f focusing the helping the uh, company's business profit from OSPO, or do you have any suggestion? I, again, I think this is a really broad question. Um, <laughs> so I think this is what you are mentioning is a great um, activity to do like as a community and have this kind of conversation as a group in the upcoming years. Because I, I think it needs it needs conversation from more people uh, and maybe having um, some kind of uh, guide or best practices published uh, outside, so uh, everyone can can share and can also um, like update this living document. I will say, but um, I, I I don't have like the answer. Uh, I think it's something that we need to work on, like like focusing on. Uh, better ways to communicate the value of the OSPO externally. I see. Thank you. Um, I know it was only tangentially related to the talk, but you talked about AI compliance. Um, what is AI compliance? Yeah, so um, I think I briefly exp 
explain it, but maybe I was not clear enough. So there were some conversations of OSPO practitioners uh, saying that they were uh, having conversations either with the ethical AI team or the compliance team or the security team, depending on the organization, uh, about uh, op like AI tooling usage when uh, developing code for the developers. Uh, they were aware of the licenses and, uh, you know, like now there is a big uh, discussion around the definition of what is open AI, uh, open source initiative are having workshops on that. They, they need, they, they, they just uh, said that, well, we still need to have more and more conversations to actually define that because it's not that, it's not like open source, it's not just one piece that you say this is open source, this is not because of there, there is an OC approved license. Um, so uh, they are having issues or similar issues when dealing with AI and they are building an AI compliance program of the organization of processes and policies on how to use instead of open source software, AI tooling uh, to develop software that will be injected in their products or in their services. Okay. Mm.